said, Doc, I'm a rugby league player. That's all I've done in my life. Now you want me to cut my leg off? Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Recovery Project with Richie Barnett and Mel Abbott. Always good to have a person on our show that, one, I truly admire, an order of a New Zealand Order of Merit in 2006, Sir Peter Blake, emerging leader in 2011, and 2008, a Hall of Famer for the New Zealand Rugby League. 378 games, ridiculous. Wow. Played for the Kiwis at 19 times and a New Zealand Māori for eight. So cool to have you on, brother. Tēnā koe. And um, awesome to have you on, brother. Ah, kia ora koura, mia te kia koutou, nga mahi nui, ka kia koutou, nga ta kōrero i tēnei ata. So yeah, real privilege, Richie, uh, lovely to meet you, Al. Tell us about, like, there's so many highs in your life, which which we always like to focus our attention on. Um, but I want I want to, because our show is based on the challenges that you've faced over the years, and I know some of the pivotal times that you've had in your life, I, th- I think the main one for me, Richie, was uh, losing my wife. Uh, and I remember when I drove into the driveway, I could see the light. There was a light in the garage in, in the shed, and I knew when I'd left that um, the light wasn't on. So I walked around the back of the shed, and I opened up the door, and then I saw a shadow hanging from the rafters. It was Letitia. Oh. She had, um, oh, how herself. awful. Yeah, she'd hung herself in the shed. So, um, you know, it was, it was probably oh. the most harrowing thing that I'd ever had to deal with. And... Um, you go through all these different stages of emotions of um, mm. you know, anger, frustration, uh, guilt, the whole sort of thing in terms of that stuff. And then it actually took me, uh, yeah, I was, I was just in this, this state of numb. I think it really changed the way that I viewed life in terms of that because I um, went through a stage then of, you know, this roller coaster of emotion where you go through that anger, uh, that mm-hmm. frustration, that guilt. So you, People on asking you the, the why questions all the time, you know, what have I just done this, you know, this didn't happen. Maybe, you know, because this is, and it was, um, what's it, 2020, it's 21 years ago now that that happened, you know, way back in 2001. So I can remember it was just clear as day in terms of that. Um, but, you know, back then you didn't really talk about that sort of stuff. Mm. No one sort of mm. talked about uh, what happened and back to New Zealand we had the funeral and that and the first funeral my children had ever been to was their mother's funeral mm. so, how old were your kids at the time so heaven had just turned 11 and my son Tyler oh. so that oh. was a tough time that was really really telling uh, you know for them so we went back to England I thought well we'll go back and you know I've got to go and stand on my own two feet and we went back I played for the rest of the season when I got back there I started drinking quite a bit I'd be out with the boys drinking vodka whiskey all the hard stuff and that you know and there was times where I never slept for like you know for three or four days because of you know all that stuff still going around in your head and Daryl pressured me into going to get some counseling and it was probably the best thing that I did you know in terms of that because um you know, the old uh, view that you have about going to counsellors is lying on this couch and then you're asking you all these questions. And it was, it was nothing like that. It was really about, you know, just going along and, and having a chat and just talking about how you're feeling and stuff. And it was probably the best thing that I ever did was to have some independent counselling from those guys. So I did that for about six months and I came back home to New Zealand and then uh, I still continued the counselling, which was really cool. I probably carried on for about another 12 to 18 months of, just, you know, every four couple of weeks, just going to sit down, have a chat, talking about how I was feeling, what my emotions were and stuff. Mm. So being that vulnerable self of yours where, you know, a lot of that's coming into vogue now in terms of that, but way back yeah. then it was really foreign. Totally. People didn't do that 20 years ago. You know. So you said you, you initially felt numb and then you had some anger. What other emotions came up for you in processing your wife's death? Yeah, that was a tough thing, Mel. It was really around, you know, for the guilt. You know, could I have done something different? You know, should I have listened more? Well, I just lobbed mm. it off you. I thought, what the, what the hell's the matter with you? You know, you, you yeah. go through those different emotions and don't worry about it. Because yeah, you know, I had the perfect wife. I had a beautiful wife. I had two beautiful children. Mm. I mean, I'd played one at premiership, one finals, played rugby league at the highest level, financially was secure, didn't have to worry about anything. I was living the dream that I'd envisioned as that young fella growing up. This mm. is what I wanted to become. And that's what I was doing, you know what mm. I mean? And then when that all happened, my world came crashing down. I thought, mm. far out. 
you know. Did, did you have any time. idea that she was sort of feeling that way or was it totally left field for you? No, I think in hindsight, when you see about, when I think back about what had happened and some of the signs and, you know, people talk about you know, how they reach out for help. And I didn't really know. You know, I was just a young fellow. Yeah. You know, we're pretty selfish as rugby league players. When you're playing football, it's all about you. You know yeah. what I mean? That's how it become because you, you know, it was yeah. to play as long as I could, make as much money and then, you know, have a really good lifestyle in terms of that mm. stuff. So that was the, didn't really think about that stuff, no, 21, 20 odd years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when you think about that, you think, ah, oh, fuck, don't worry about it, mate. Just carry on. Mm. You know, that was the sort of attitude. Uh, but in hindsight, when I look back on it, you know, you go through those different emotions. I was really lucky. You know, going through that counselling part and, and getting to talk to people really, you know, I got to a space in the end and it took a long while. It took me about nearly two and a half years, two years to, to get to the space where I was, could be at peace with thinking, well, you know, the counsellor said to me, listen, at the end of the day, it's the decision. You, know, you don't know where they were, what was happening in terms of mm. that. Um, and, you know, for me, it was, um, yeah, it was quite life-changing when I came to that realisation that mm. if I carried on thinking the way I was, how was that going to impact on me and my children? Yeah. Mm. And, and what was it going to impact on them? Mm. So, yeah, that's probably, the, you know, when we talk about challenges and overcoming some of that stuff, oh, mate, that was still, you know, mm. I can still remember it was yesterday about what happened. It never leaves you. No. You and, and move on in terms of that. Mate. So, it has been, that's probably the most challenging. Losing losing half a league is nothing compared to that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's get on that. So, you, know, you know, so in terms of that. You are, you're up there, bro. You're, you're, the, you're the best. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just like, I, this is the first time I've heard that. Like I've, I've heard parts of it, T, but I've, I didn't, I've never heard it from, from your mouth. And mm. I've got to, I've got to say that, that counselling for the, for the next sort of year or so, far out. That's amazing. Mm. That that actually stuck. Wow. Yeah, you know, mate. It's good to talk to other people because you know, if you don't talk to people, you, mm. all those thoughts and things go round and round in your head. Where, where how are you going to release it? You know, what do you do? Mm. I'm a big advocate now. I'm doing some work with the Rural Support Trust in New Zealand at the moment, uh, going out and talking to farmers about you know some of the challenges that I face, and I share that story, Richie, because it's very important yeah. because a lot of them are live in isolated communities, they don't talk or socialise too often, so that's some of the stuff that I talk about. Mm. And this is, you know, most farmers are pretty staunch, you know, for us as mm. Kiwi men, we don't like talking about shit, do we? The only no. time they talk is when, Richie, when do fellas talk? Yeah, we have a few drinks. When when something happens. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? Because uh, yep. that's the only time that guys talk, so we're saying, hey, listen, and, but sometimes too, you know, for a lot of people, they don't want to talk to people that they know. So they don't want yeah. to let themselves be vulnerable or open up to family members or mates. You know, it's too hard because they'll think, you know, um, you know, they might think they're weak or they're soft or whatever mm. it is. You know? So I think one of the things about that is sometimes it's good to talk to a stranger. You know what I mean? Yeah. The people who just want to listen to you, you know, it is really, really important. So let's move on to your, um, your mighty leg. Bro, like that's and you you because you wash it down because of you know the impact that you've you can only you can only when things happen in your life at particularly a crisis point that you've you've rightly said just before the leg is just an irrelevant story but it is a story that we need to talk about so tell us about what actually happened when you uh got your leg ripped out or ripped off yeah and i got ripped off there mate that came around the corner as I came around the corner, the, there was a guy in a Land Rover and, he, and the guy had cut the corner. He was coming straight towards me. He was going to have a head on and crash head on into me. And I thought, shit, he's going to hit me. So I was going about 80. I dropped the bike and it swerved past the front of the Land Rover and, and then I went down the side of it. I don't know if you've been in a car crash or a motorcycle accident, but everything happens in slow motion. I thought I was in that movie, The Matrix. You know The Matrix when they do those mm -hmm. things in slow motion? It was exactly like that. I ended up doing a couple of somersaults, slammed into the bank, bounced off the bank, and landed on the side of the road. The motorbike went skidding off into the side of the ditch and ended up in the drain on the side of the road. The bike had flipped right over, the accelerator jammed, and it was making a hell of a noise. And the guy that had clipped me on the motorbike come running back and he said, mate, mate, are you okay? I said, yeah, no, mate, I'm fine. But he run down there, turned my key and turned the gas off because I didn't want my bike to catch on fire and blow up. So off he goes, turns the key off, and he comes back and said, you okay? And I said, yeah, mate, I'm not too bad. He goes, uh, and I tried to stand up. I pushed off my, I had my leathers and had my jeans on and everything. I was fine, had the helmet rolled over. Pushed off my left leg and stood up. 
And then my right leg buckled and I looked down and blood was pissing out the side of my feet. My leg was just giving me this very odd tense. There was a white hot shooting pain from the bottom of my heel into my groin. Felt like someone grabbed a red hot poker and just shoved it through the middle of my leg. It was just really white, intense, hot, searing pain up into my groin. So when the ambulance guy turned up, I said, mate, my leg's giving me some grief. Have you have got anything for the pain? He says, oh, Mr. Nico, listen, we don't have any drugs in our ambulances in Huntley because people break in and they steal everything. I said, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he's killing me, mate. Have you got to say, he went and got a St. John's bag, opened it up and he pulls out some Panadol. I said, fucking Panadol. That's Panadol. <laughs> oh, he goes, he comes back again. He said, listen, I just rung the wife at the hospital there and I said, we well, spent helicopter down for you. So there I was, Richie. I was in hospital for the next six weeks. During that six weeks, I had 30 major operations under anaesthetic. Uh, what they were doing was um, they were trying to debride my leg every day. So I lost 30 kgs in six weeks because I had a, I couldn't eat anything. It was in the hospital mm. every day. No my mouth. Uh, they just had a drip in my neck. Uh, I lost 30 kgs. I had six major blood transfusions. I had a clot mm. in my lung, compartment syndrome in my quad. I woke up one morning. I thought it was a halt. My leg was like three times the normal size. Doctor comes in, he says, oh, Mr. Nico, listen, I've got some good news and some bad news. I said, oh, yeah, well, what's the bad news, Doc? He said, well, we're going to have to stay in hospital for another 18 months to two years, and we're going to oh. try I said, what? What happened is I'd shattered the femur, the big bone. I still got a titanium rod with some pins in. Smashed the tibia and fibula, two bones in the lower leg were smashed. I had a compound fracture. The bone went straight through the top of my ankle, came out the side of my foot. And I mm. From the heel, the toe got ripped right off. So it was all mounted. So he said, you can stay in hospital for another 18 months to two years and try and save your leg. Um, and we've got to do all these operations. Take the lat muscle off one side, graft that around. Take the lat muscle off the other side, graft that around. Oh. You don't know whether or not you'll be able to use your leg again. Oh. I said, well, that's not too bad, 18 months to two years. I said, what's the good news? He said, the good news is if you cut it off, you'll be out of here in two weeks. I said, what? <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Nico, if you have the leg amputated just below the knee, you'll be out of hospital in two weeks. You'll be up and running in six to seven weeks. I said, Doc, I'm a rugby league player. That's all I've done in my life. Now you want me to cut my leg off? He goes, well, that's the good news and the bad news, Mr. Nico. I'll see you later on. I've got to go and do the rest of my rounds. How do you think I was feeling? Uh, pretty mm. sure. Pretty yeah. Good. Right? Shocked. Pretty After being in there for six weeks, so that's what the doc comes up with the news. So when the doc walked out, my mum was there sitting at the end of the bed, turned around to my lady, said to my mum, oh, mum, what do you think I should do with my leg? She goes, it's your bloody leg. You can do whatever you want to do with the bloody thing. Oh. <laughs> Told you not to buy that bloody motorbike. You didn't listen to me then, did you? <laughs> so uh, later on that afternoon, I saw the doc. He was walking past. So I said, doc, doc, come in here. He said, yes, Mr. Nico, what can I do? He said, that's it, cut the bloody thing off. I want to get home and look after my kids and make sure they're mm. all good. And he said, right, we'll cut it off tomorrow at 12 o'clock. I said, what, tomorrow, 12 o'clock? I was like that in the bed. Yeah, because you need a bit of grieving time, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, nah, I wasn't too bad. But um, the, the main reason why I wanted to get my leg cut off is I wanted to get home and look after my kids. You know, mm. they've been through a tough time 18 months earlier, losing their mum with suicide over in the UK. Oh, that's close timing. Yeah, mm. you know, I was 18 months later banged up in hospital, probably going to be there for another 12 to 18, you know, 18 yeah. months, two years trying to figure my leg out. And then, you know, I thought, oh, shit, who's going to look after these guys, you know? Yeah. The time. Even they just turned 13 and my son time was 11, so, you know, they're yeah. doing some pretty rough time. So, yeah, decided to have the leg amputated, got it cut off the next day, was out of hospital within two weeks, and then was up running, you know. The only thing I can't really do now is run as fast as what I used to run. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was tough, Mel. I remember because when I had the operation, I had my leg amputated. It was about lunchtime and I got back to the room and I went to sleep. I was all drugged up and I woke up about three o'clock in the morning. And I was busting to go to the toilet. And, you know, because I'd been on the on all the drugs and everything else, it took me. I forgot all about it that I had my leg amputated. I rolled out of the bed and I went to walk and I fell down, smashed my leg on the ground. Oh. I was at the bottom of it. I was that week because I couldn't pull myself up on the bed because, you know, I'd lost 30 kgs. I only had a drip. I wasn't eating much. I had to get the nurse to come and make one of those up and down beds that went like that. So I began to come and get her to help me onto the bed. And I remember sitting on the end of the bed and I was looking down. Blood was pissing out of my leg. 
I was having, I was crying to myself, and I thought, what, shit, what does a former one-legged rugby league player do? Mm. Mm. So you go through all those emotions, you go through that, yeah. that feeling sorry for yourself, or what am I going to do? But it's only for a moment. Yeah. So the transition for me, the hardest thing was learning how to walk. Mm. You know, that was you know after playing football, you take it for granted. You know, to run mm. to walk and all that sort of stuff. But it took me about three weeks to learn how to walk again. And then mm. after that, uh, about nine months later, I ended up going to do the New York Marathon. So never ran oh. a marathon, but I ended up doing the marathon with one leg. What a clever fellow I was. I, but once again, it was about really testing myself and, and pushing myself and challenging myself once again after that happened in terms of it. So, you know, there's been a couple of challenges, but, you know, losing the legs, you know, there's nothing. Mm. I was in hospital and there was a, while well, I was in the amputee ward, once I had my leg uh, amputated, I was sitting in the hospital and this young kid, he was eight years old, he had both of these amputated. Um, oh. He was on the back of the tractor with his father and he was feeding out some hay to the cows and the tractor slid down the hill and it flipped over. So his father got killed, he was squashed under the tractor and he got trapped under the trailer. Oh. Yeah, so and I, was, I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, you know, here's this eight-year-old boy who's just lost his dad, just mm. lost both of his feet. Oh. Yeah, what am I got to be worried about? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean they cut off. Oh, yeah. Through those challenges, you always think there's somebody not yeah. willing that somebody's worse off than you, but you are mm. worse off than what you are. Absolutely. That's an amazing yeah. attitude. Yeah. It's all about attitude, eh, Mel? That's one thing. Yeah. Like, when I first started, I've always had a shitload of attitude. Sometimes yeah. it might not be good, but most of the time it has been. You know, your attitude determines everything for me. And mm. everything totally, because you could just do the whole, like, you know, poor me, chip on your shoulder the rest of your life, or you can oh, yeah. get on and live a fulfilled life and you know it oh, sounds yeah. like you had an amazing approach to that yeah well when was that 2004 when i had my leg amputated so that's what 18 years ago now i've had the best life in the last 18 years met a beautiful young lady got married got more kids got grandkids got an awesome job do what i want to do have a really good work-life balance man i get to do heaps of cool stuff why is that that's awesome that's awesome that's Right. Yeah, that's just fab. It's like making my eyes prickly, like, you know, yeah. hearing you just having such a full, fantastic life, not letting that just stop you at all. You just like get on with it. You know, that's yeah, amazing. It yeah, it definitely was hard. I mean, there were some tough times through yeah. all of that stuff. You know, where I was a lot, did I cry? Shit, you, you know, mm. where there's some lows, definitely. But, mm. you know, the thing is that uh, life's for the living and life's yeah. worth living and, and loving. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, mm. You know, we all face. Every, every one of us face different challenges at different times. We've all been through mm. tough times, Mel, Richie, yeah. you know, all of us. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, uh, you know, in one of our um, team one statements, we've got a statement called the quality of life statement. It goes like this. Quality of life you will ultimately enjoy. It's not so much determined by what happens to you, but by your attitude towards it and what you decide to do about it. Mm. You can live that 100%. That's mm. something I, I live by every day. Uh, you know, I've got kids, I've got grandkids now, and um, you know, I'm very fortunate to be in a position to be able to do what I do. You know, and um, uh, yeah, uh, there's you know, you, you make some sacrifices, takes a lot of hard work. You either go through the highs, you go through the lows, but at the end of the day, I, I truly believe that you know, if it's up to you, your life's up to you, and what you determine about what you want to do about it. So, I'm just that is uh. See, that's so like our show was always both based on taking certain things, aspects of people's lives, and use them to support and help other people that are going through challenges. Mm. You've certainly given us a freaking ton of those, which I knew you would. (laughs) You really have. And I love the fact that you've given us some the attitude thing, which is so important. You know, life's happening for us, not to us, Mm. aspects, you know, which it is. Um, you've given but us, hard, Richie, you but, it's, but it's hard, Richie, sometimes because if you don't have that environment or you you don't know that, it's it's really tough sometimes. You know, mm. for a lot of people, if you if you're brought up in an environment or a culture where that's all you know, and, and that's, you don't know any different. You know what I mean? You don't know any different. But it's about um, sharing some of these tools about supporting people through and you know, through the stuff that you guys are doing. You know, with you and Mel, uh, I, I think that's fantastic because we need to share more of these stories. The, the other thing about that, oh, I've been really lucky. I've always had a good support network around my mum, mm. my, sister, my brothers, my family. You know, yeah. and for a lot of people, they don't have that. So I really empathise with some people that struggle to get out of, you know, some of those mindsets sometimes. So 
It's about really yeah. surrounding yourself with good people, uh, putting yeah. yourself in a good environment. And my old man always said to me, you hang around with dogs, you're going to catch fleas. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> you know, it's just simple things like that. You know what I mean? So if you want to be successful, you know, hang around successful people. If you want to be positive, you know, hang yeah. around positive people. You know, there's a whole lot of different roller coaster of emotions that you go through during the highs and the lows. And I've experienced mm-hmm. the highs, which have been the best of the best. And I've experienced the lows, which have been the tragic and the most horrific thing. Mm. That's the person you are today, brother. That's why yeah. we respect you, mate. Totally. You know, I think you know what you guys are doing is fantastic too. Yeah, bro. Yeah, and thoughts to our brother. Yeah, Inga. Yeah, thank you yeah, so yeah. much. Like that's you know amazing stories. To oh, yeah, I, mean, stories. I can't tell you all the other stories because there's too much. Of it. I'll tell you some stories about Richie and I, but you won't want to hear those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do we say? Um, We're just going to, like, seriously, I really appreciate you, bro, um, coming on our show. Um, You always welcome so many good nuggets, mate. You've got so much knowledge, but most of all, you've got such a good wider way. Your your attitude is ridiculous. That's why you've accomplished what you have and what you're going to do from here on in. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart to have you on our show. Um, and that's really us for our episode here, which is mm-hmm. freaking unreal. And we look yeah. forward to the next, I guess, we're going to be doing this for the next year, I guess, less than a year. We do one every second week. So hopefully it'll inspire other people. Really great. I have to go online and have a look at the shows now and see if there's any other good fellas like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go and check them out. We've, no, yeah, we've had some amazing ones. Everybody's got a story. Uh, Mel, uh, Richie, yeah. uh, just getting people to tell their story because we all, you know, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, we all face different challenges. Totally. And and the the theme, yeah, we've sort of seen themes coming out around, um, you know, the 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 need to express repressed emotion has come up quite a lot. To clear the past stuff to not affect the present. Positive attitude has come up many times. Um, You know, the the need for people to. Um, to look at what they've got instead of what they haven't got that's come up quite a bit Um, but yeah within that every story has been unique so um, yeah to our viewers who are watching this I'd encourage you to you know go and check out our other stories as well you can um, hear about people recovering from cancer MS um, you know terrible bacterial infections that they nearly died from depression fertility issues weight loss issues um, you know, we've had a whole range. So, yeah, they, we um, want people to know that whatever they're dealing with, you can get better. That's the big message, isn't it? You can find a way to being feeling good again. Thanks very much, uh, you too. So it's real privilege and honor. So, ni a te kia koura, a no rei a te nā koutou, te nā koutou. Hei kona. Awesome. Hei kona, brother. I'm on the road, it's my time, taking control of